Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Jenna and I do something a little bit different on this channel. So basically I like to do my makeup at the same time as talking about a true crime case. So I'm not a makeup artist but I love makeup. I'm not a detective but I love true crime. Put it all together in a video and that is me. So that being said let's jump into the video. So today's case I have to warn is a little bit gruesome. Some bits in it actually make me physically cringe and it's about a man named Neville Heath. So Neville George Cleveley Heath, I think it's Cleveley, I've heard different pronunciations, but Neville, was born on the 6th of June 1917 to parents William and Betty Heath. Now as I give you some background um, on Neville's like life timeline, um, you got to bear in mind that he wasn't the average serial killer. So for those of you who are interested in true crime, like me, would know that a lot of serial killers, like the majority of them, would have had some kind of abuse in their past. So whether that be um, physical, mental or sexual abuse, or like a number of the three, like a mixture, most serial killers would have had some sort of abuse in their childhood. Um, but Neville didn't have anything like that. He had no abuse in his childhood whatsoever which there were serial killers out there that had this as well, but it was just very rare. And there was no sign of adolescent drug or alcohol abuse, which is again, another um, like characteristic that serial killers seem to have. Also um, head injuries. So th that's another, yet again, another characteristic that a lot of serial killers have is they have some kind of head injury in their past and Neville had literally none of the normal, normal serial killer traits. With this being said, um, Neville often sparked the nature versus nurture debate in where everything in his life seemed quite um, normal, but he just seemed to not be wired right. There was nothing in his past um, that people could point to and say, you know, this is why he was like that and this is why he ended out the way he the way he did. But he just he just was. He just was him. There was nothing pointing to it at all. Neville attended school in southwest London and from an early age showed signs of some quite disturbing behaviour. So there was one time that he was in class and a girl next to him dropped her pencil and as she went down to pick up the pencil, um, Neville aggressively stamped on her fingers um, with like a smile on his face and looking all like evil and stuff. Um, and I think you kind of, you could put that down to him just being a little shit, you know, kids do stupid things sometimes. Then another time a teacher found him um, spanking a young girl with a ruler and she was screaming out and he was just laughing. That's a little bit more disturbing. Apart from this though, um, Neville's school friends look back on, on their time knowing him with quite fond memories. He was, you know, just a normal person, always looked really smart, looked a little bit older than everyone else. So they thought he was quite cool. Um, yeah, so they didn't see an issue with him at all. At age 16, Neville passed his school certificate, so like his exam, um, but he didn't score high enough to get into university and uh, his parents and his teachers thought that he was a lot smarter and wanted him to resit his exam, uh, but Neville was having none of it. He just wanted to be done with school, get on and see the world pretty much. Um, and his first job was as a packer in a warehouse and he thought this was terribly beneath him. So as soon as he turned 18, he decided to join the Royal Air Force. He was actually a natural at flying um, and showed a lot of potential. So within a year, he was promoted to flying officer and he was posted to RAF Duxford and he got to fly Gloucester Gladiators, which is a type of aeroplane that they used at the time. So it was around this time that Neville's behaviour um, just started to, I guess, develop, but not in a nice way. Um, and especially his behaviour towards women started to develop in a drastic way. So later on, a woman would recall that at this time she was kind of like dating Neville a little bit and he asked her to spend the night with him. And when she refused, he suddenly lost it and just started hitting her in the face and in the body. And luckily she was able to get away, but kind of makes you think what would have happened if she couldn't run away that day. Things weren't going great for Neville in other ways too. So he was by no means poor on his wage, but see old Nev liked the finer things in life. He liked like a luxurious lifestyle, but he just couldn't pay for it. So at this point he started embezzling funds and bouncing checks, naughty, naughty. In March, 1937, 
Neville won his pilot wings, so like he passed his tests and stuff like that, and he was posted to RAF Middenhall. I'll, I'll put it here on the screen because I can't pronounce words again. I, I struggle, I struggle. Where for some reason, pretty much straight away, he deserted and he ran away to his parents' home in Wimbledon. The RAF police came to arrest him three months later and because he gave his word as a gentleman to not run away, they decided that he could stay under open arrest um, until a month later he stole a car and he ran away. A few months later in July, um, he actually ended up in court for just like a small crime because by this point he'd run away, he was living off of crime, so he ended up in, in court. And instead of being sent to prison, he was actually sent to a newly built Borstal and only served two months in this Borstal. So in 1938, Neville joined the Royal Army and in early 1940, he was posted to the Middle East. Just a year later, though, uh, Neville was dismissed from the army for um, forging a second pay book and bouncing cheque. So because of this, he was sent back to England. But... He decided that he wasn't going to do this, so he abandoned ship in a place called Durban in South Africa and then made his way to Johannesburg in South Africa. It was in Johannesburg that he met 18-year-old Elizabeth Rivers, who was a member of quite a rich um, and well-known family in Johannesburg. He decided that he would introduce himself not by his real name, but under the name of Bruce Lockhart. Now, this did not fly with Elizabeth's parents, and they quickly found out that this was not his real name. And when questioned on this, he made up a bit of a story and said that his real name was James Robert Cadogan Armstrong, and that his whole family had actually died. So using his real name would be too painful for him, so he just decided to use another name. So the parents weren't really buying his story, but... Elizabeth clearly did because they eloped and they married in February of 1942 and then the following September they had a son named Robert. So over the next two years things seemed to be going quite well for Neville. Um, he seemed to be a good father and a good husband, although he was, you know, having multiple affairs at the time. Um, but, you know, he seemed to be doing OK. And then things were about to change. When in May of 1944, he was seconded um, to England to join the bomber squad. It was whilst he was in England. Um, so there were these women called Wrens, and that stood for Women's, there, Women's Royal Naval Service. And they would call them Wrens, the women that worked in it. And um, a lot of officers, you know, fancied them, wanted to show off to them. And never was no exception. But he showed off to them by um, faking his flying logs and by and by issuing checks that he knew were going to bounce. So six months later, when his time was up from his secondment, he went back to South Africa and he was arrested on arrival for charges of fraud. Elizabeth, his wife, um, her parents had had an absolute enough of him by now. Um, so they offered him £2,000, which in today's money is around £86,000 offered him this money um, to divorce their daughter, give full custody of um, his son to her, and to just disappear. And guess what he did? No surprises here. He, uh, he took the money and run. So Neville went back to England, and within the same month of him arriving back in England, he got himself into a little predicament at the Strand Palace Hotel in London. So on the 23rd of February 1946, the manager of the hotel um, bursts into a bedroom, to find Neville with another woman and he was hitting her repeatedly or spanking her while she was naked laid on the bed. So basically an electrician that was working in the hotel had um, gone past the room and heard a woman screaming and saying stop stop so he went and reported it to the manager, the manager then um, burst up to the room and interrupted it. Now it's said that Neville was actually really annoyed at um, the manager bursting in and interrupting his fun um, and no charges were ever pressed or anything because the lady, I don't think she said it, but it was assumed and the evidence pointed at the fact that she had willingly been tied up. Because, you know, people did it back then. People were into bondage and all that back then. I think it was a bit more taboo, but people still did it. So fair play. But she obviously just didn't know how far he would take it and um, how hard he would hit. 
So the pair were later seen exiting the building, um, holding hands and giggling. So that was that. So one day in June, it was either the 19th or the 20th. I kept getting a bit confused with the dates. But anyway, uh, Neville was drinking in a pub in Fleet Street in London. Um, and he was drinking with some journalists. He was offering these journalists um, some flights because he was a pilot. So one of the journalists gave him £30, which doesn't seem like a lot. But in today's money, that's £1,300. So he gave him this money for a flight to Copenhagen. And of course, in true Neville style, as soon as their backs were turned, he was out of there, he took the money and he ran. With his money, um, he decided to spend the afternoon in a private club, and then he took a taxi to the Trevor Arms in Westminster. It was in the Trevor Arms that he met Marjorie Gardiner. Marjorie was 32 years old, and she had recently left her alcoholic husband and her baby in Sheffield, and now she left them to go to London to seek fame and fortune. Marjorie had actually been in a, a couple of films as just as an extra but she didn't really get very far with her fame and fortune goal um, so she mostly spent her time hanging around with a, a kind of questionable social circle um, and this would include people um, like thieves, pimps, people yeah just unsavoury characters really. She was known to be sexually submissive and what she would often do is go from hotel room to hotel room, sleeping with men in exchange for a meal and a bed to sleep in for that night. After Neville met Marjorie, they were seen in a few places um, across London, and then they eventually went to a place called the Panama Club. They continued drinking at this club, um, and of course, by now, they would be very drunk. And, you know, Neville was drinking all day at this point, and um, for those of you that know what it's like, one of those all day drinking sessions, they're a lot. They're definitely a lot. After they had had enough drinking, they made their way to the Pembridge Court Hotel via taxi. Now, later on, the taxi driver, um, a man called Harry Harter, he would say that, um, Neville, that Neville paid way too much for the taxi, almost like he was trying to show off. Now this just goes to show like what his behaviour was like at the time. He had this, um, he just had a big ego and made out that he was something that he wasn't, like more important than he was. He was also um, introducing himself as Lieutenant Colonel Neville Heath at the time, which he wasn't that at all. On Friday the 21st of June, a maid would enter room four of the Pembridge Court Hotel. It was there that she would find a dark haired woman laying on one of the single beds with bloodstained sheets covered up to her neck and she was indeed dead. Police arrived soon after um, and it was noted straight away that the clothes that she had been wearing were neatly folded on the chair in the room so this would suggest that um, when Marjorie first came into the room that she was comfortable because I guess if your clothes were ripped off you or taken off you really quickly they'd be in a pile like just chucked but these were nicely laid out um, so that they wouldn't crease etc so yeah they thought that she was comfortable with whoever she was with when she first got there. A wartime identity card identified this lady as 32 year old Marjorie Gardiner. The scene of crime photos um, they showed that Marjorie was horribly mutilated so just a warning this part is really bad and this actually makes me really cringe saying this so just a warning it gets a bit grosser. She was bound by her wrists and her ankles, with her right arm pinned behind her back. Her wrists had been bound with a white handkerchief. Marjorie had wounds on her face from being punched, and she also had 17 injuries that were made by some kind of object, they think a whip. Now, Marjorie's nipples had been nearly bitten off, and she was heavily bleeding from downstairs. The lack of defence wounds on her like arms and everywhere that you'd usually find them, coupled with the fact that she neatly folded her clothes, um, yeah, would suggest again that she willingly went to the room and she was willingly tied up. Again, nothing wrong with bondage and stuff if you practice it safely. The cause of death was found to be asphyxiation. Oh, I did not say that word properly, did I? Asphyx asphyxiation. Probably through the use of a gag. There is a quote by the pathologist, uh, Professor Keith Simpson, and I wanted to read this quote because it's literally from his word, so it just shows you how bad it is. So, quote, 
Even without the 17 lash marks, the girl's injuries were appalling. Both nipples and some soft breast tissue had been bitten away and there was a seven inch tear in her vagina and was beyond caused by the short poker found in the fireplace. Can you see why I was cringing now? It's absolutely awful. And the worst bit is that she would have been alive through all of that. So she would have been in so much pain. Detective Superintendent Thomas Barrett was now in charge of this case. And he found that the hotel room was under Neville's name. Neville was now a person of interest. Thank God. Um, and his details were passed around to every police force in the country. And they actually put out a what was called a murder notice to the police and it had um neville's mugshot and it also had a very um a very in-depth description of neville and his appearance and the clothes he was wearing at the time this was sent to everybody all the police force around the country every exit port um just everywhere so after killing marjorie neville washed the whip that he used on her and he took the scarf that he used to tie her with. He then packed that in a suitcase, took a taxi and then a train to Brighton. He then signed in under his real name in a hotel in Worthing, which is the next town over from Brighton. He telephoned a woman named Yvonne Simmons and he arranged to meet her for lunch the next day. Yvonne was someone that um, Neville had met previously at a, a dance in Chelsea and she was a wren. He had also actually um, proposed to her at the Pembridge Court Hotel, which was the same hotel that he killed Marjorie in. Yvonne would say that her lunch with Neville was memorable then, and that he turned to her at some point and said, Yvonne, there's been a nasty murder in London. Have you heard about it in the papers? And when she said no, he changed the subject. But then he brought it up again when they went out for dinner the same evening and Yvonne recalled to the police what the conversation went like. And again, I'm gonna read this because it's like a quote. So this is what he said to her. The murder took place in the same room that we stayed in. I knew the girl. She was with some man named Jack, who had nowhere to stay, so I gave them the key to my room and went to sleep somewhere else. The police, an inspector, got on to me and took me round to the room. I saw the body. It was a pretty gruesome sight. When Yvonne asked how this woman died, Neville quite calmly said, A poker was stuck up her. I think that's what killed her. The police seemed to believe that she was suffocated. Now, you've got to realise as well, these were different times. I know we like to talk about I don't know how I do, like to talk about things like um, true crime and stuff. But back then, you, you didn't really talk about it in normal conversation. So for someone to quite calmly say, had a poker shoved up her, you'd be like, what? It's just shocking. So Yvonne obviously wanted to go home at this point because she was in shock. So Neville just walked her home. So Yvonne called, ugh, called Neville the next day um, and said that she had read the newspaper article about him. Uh, with her parents and that her parents were very worried oh my god the amount of fallout on my face Whoa. neville tried to reassure her and he said actually i thought your parents would be concerned i've now got a car i'm going back to london to sort things and i'll probably call you this evening but she actually never heard from him again that would be the last time they actually talked to each other now neville was thinking shit if they call the police they're gonna know where i am so he decided to write a um, a weird letter to the superintendent. Um, I won't read it out because it's, it's actually quite long, but it's just a crap excuse for a letter. Basically trying to say, like, from his point of view, how things went down and blah, blah, blah. But this poster was actually sent from Worthing. It had, like, a postmark on it. Idiot. So coupled that with a tip-off from Yvonne's parents, because they did actually call the police, they managed to find out where he was staying, like what hotel it was, and they went down there and they searched his room and he was gone. Now, Neville managed to get himself down to Brighton and he booked into room 81 of the Tollard Royal Hotel. He booked in under the name of Rupert Brooke. He decided not to use his real name this time. What I thought was weird is Rupert Brooke is actually a real person. He's a, he was quite a well-known um, English poet. So I don't really understand why you would use someone like semi-famous. Like what if they knew what this dude looked like or I don't know. Now at this hotel it was like quite wealthy people that were staying there. But it was just after World War II so I guess the only people that could afford to holiday were wealthy people anyway. So Neville would 
well he's Rupert now, he would stay in the hotel um, and he would sit with pretty much the same people every day and he would tell tales of what he used to do when he was in the war. And from what accounts um, say, people liked him. They thought he was really interesting. They respected him for what he did in the war. Now, unfortunately, um, we're not 100% sure on how he actually met his next victim because we can only go by what Neville said to himself to the police. Neville said that he met Doreen Marshall while he was out sat on the promenade, which is the waterfront. Um, and she was with another young lady named Peggy that he already knew. Um, and he decided to walk with the pair, just having a little chat, and then he asked Doreen to tea that day. So a bit of background on Doreen. Doreen Margaret Marshall was 21 years old, and she was quite a um, shy but sweet, pretty girl. She was actually a wren in the war also. After the war, Doreen got really sick with the measles and flu. So when she had recovered some, her father, Charles Marshall, sent her to a hotel in Brighton in order for her to recover fully. He booked her into the Norfolk Royal Hotel and just paid for the whole thing. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? You had the flu? Go on, have a holiday. So during tea with Neville, so during tea with Doreen, he actually asked her out for dinner that evening too, which she accepted. It was around 8.15 by this point and Neville was just sweeping her off her feet. She was very impressed. He was complimenting her and telling her all of his exciting stories from the war. But this wouldn't last. Other guests would later say that um, Neville, well, Rupert, was getting more and more drunk um, and that Doreen was looking very like pale and tired and just wanted to go back to her hotel and sleep. By 10pm, Doreen really wasn't feeling great, um, but Neville, aka Rupert, uh, managed to persuade her to stay out a little bit longer so they went into a different a different room um, where they joined three other guests there was Miss Parfit and Mr and Mrs Phillips later on Doreen would actually clutch at Mr Phillips arm and ask him to book her a taxi and this as you can probably guess really pissed Neville off so he waited for Mr and Mrs uh, Phillips to go up to bed and when they had done, he said to the night porter to cancel the taxi and that he would be walking Doreen home. He said after this um, that he would be half an hour. This was around 12.15 at night and this would be the last time that anybody saw Doreen alive. At around 4am, the night porter had realised that Rupert, Neville, had not actually come back yet and he was very concerned so he went up to his room and he knocked on the door and there was no answer so he decided to open the door just to you know check and Neville was actually oh, sorry Rupert Neville Rupert Neville was actually asleep in his bed next day the manager um kind of jokingly asked him a question about this and he said that he had played a prank funny on the night porter and earlier that day he uh, apparently put a ladder on the side of the building because no one would see that would they leading up to his bedroom window and that he decided to climb up through there to confuse the night porter the manager thought it was kind of weird but he believed him there's no reason not to believe him now next day remember mrs phillips so gladys phillips well she was like a little bit of a detective she was good in the morning she asked she asked Rupert how his girlfriend was from the previous night and when he answered oh she's just she's with someone else today Gladys thought this was a bit fishy though she thought she'd do a little bit more digging she noticed that he was wearing a, um, a scarf like a silk scarf and she thought hmm he doesn't usually wear a scarf because every other day she had seen him he was wearing an open necked shirt and she asked to take a closer look at it she complimented him on it so of course his ego is, is boosted a bit so she asked to take a closer look at it and when he took it off she could see that he had deep scratches in his neck by this time as well um the manager of doreen's hotel was starting to get concerned because obviously one of his guests was missing he knew that she was at the tollard royal hotel the previous night so decided to ring up the manager ivor ralph and explain to him his concerns Now Ivor was 
also a little bit concerned once he said this. Oh, I've got hair somewhere. <laughs> Ivor was also concerned because once he heard this, he thought maybe it's a little bit odd now, the uh, prank that Rupert pulled on the night porter. And also the night porter had now said to him that Rupert and Doreen were actually arguing just before they left the hotel. Now, put this together with what Mrs Phillips said about, you know, the scratches, and she also said that Doreen was looking very upset that night. Now, by this point, you know, people were talking, and <laughs> without sounding horrible, again, it's probably the times, you know, the, these kind of rich people, they love to gossip, so of course they were gossiping now about Rupert, and they were wondering why, for someone, you know, everyone at this hotel was obviously had some money, and yet he seemed to wear, well not he didn't seem to wear, he wore the same clothes every day and this was a little bit suspicious. They also noted that he had never actually uh, paid his bar bill yet and this was of course um, quite big at this point. Because of this the manager, Ivor, decided to have a little word with Rupert. He informed him that the lady that he was dining with the night before had gone missing. Whilst he um, was like talking about the lady he said something like, I think she's from a place called Pinner. Just like a, a passing comment. And then he also asked Rupert to pay his bill. Now Rupert's response was, sorry, Neville, oh, Neville, Rupert. Anyway, his response was a little bit odd. So he just said, yes, I know that woman, um, but she's not from Pinner. Um, and I'll pay you the bill later. Now he just totally skirted over the fact that he had just been informed that the woman that he was dining with is now missing and he didn't seem worried at all. Ivor then suggested that Rupert call the local police to see if there's anything that he could do to help. At this point Neville thought, oh for God's sake, if I don't call them then he's going to call them. So he called the local police and he asked if they had a photograph of the now missing Doreen. He later on went up to the um, police station to see if there was anything he could do to help. They showed him a photograph and he confirmed that yes he did dine with this lady um, and he acted like he was quite shocked um, and upset that she was missing. He also informed them that he had uh, apparently seen her the next day with an American officer. The detective in charge at this point was a man named Detective Constable George Souter. Now George did not believe anything that was coming out of Rupert's mouth. He smelt a rat. Now, Detective Souter knew that he didn't have the authority um, to keep him in for questioning, uh, so he just tried to, you know, pass the time and try to keep him there. Luckily, though, as he was doing this, uh, two people walked into the station. This was a man and a woman, a man named Charles Marshall and woman named Mrs. Crookshanks. I think that's how you say it. I'm sorry, I keep getting things wrong. Which was Doreen's father and sister. Now, Neville spotted these two, obviously, um, and Mrs. Crookshanks looked very similar to her sister, Doreen, and Detective Souter saw that this absolutely panicked Rupert. He started to sweat, he went red, just overall, yeah, was just starting to panic. So Detective Souter thought this is the perfect time to say something. So basically, as soon as Rupert had walked into the police station, the detective thought he recognised him, so had a look through his files and saw that there was a murder notice sent out recently for a man named Neville Heath. And this man in front of him, Rupert, looked exactly like Neville Heath. So he held up this notice um, and said, Brooks, is your real name Heath? Dun dun dun! His reply was, oh god no, that's not me, but I agree it does look like me. When the inspector arrived, uh, Detective Inspector George Gates, he thought, well, we can't can't call it in to the Metropolitan Police in London yet because we don't really have enough evidence to do so. They didn't even have enough lawful suspicion to get a warrant to search um, Rupert's room. That was until old Neville, Rupert, whatever you want to call him, got a bit, uh, got a bit cocky. So he was getting a bit chilly at this point, um, a bit cold, needed a jacket, so asked if one of the police officers would fetch his jacket from his room for him. So they went and got the jacket, brought it back to the station, searched it in front of him, 
and uh, they found a cloakroom ticket which was issued at Bournemouth station. So upon finding this ticket they went down to the station, gave the ticket in, got the suitcase that was in the station and then when they took it back to the station they searched it. What did they find? They found a blue scarf and a neckerchief which were bloodstained and had hairs like caught and attached and everything and they found a leather whip. In another pocket they found an artificial pearl, just one of them. So this gave them enough to search his room. In his room they looked in a drawer and they found a bloodstained handkerchief that was like tied in a tight knot and it had hairs stuck in the knot. Rupert or Neville, whatever you want to call him at this point, he insisted that he was indeed Rupert Brooks and he tried telling like a, a one of his stories um, to try and get himself out of it but of course this didn't work. And at 9.45 that evening, um, the inspector, George Gates, would say to him, I am now satisfied that you are Neville George Cleveley Heath and I'm going to detain you pending the arrival of the Metropolitan Police. And uh, Neville said, um, oh, all right. That was his reply, I just thought it was quite funny. Anyway, the next day, Detective Inspector Reginald Spooner arrived from London and on Monday, the 8th of July, 1946, Neville was charged with the murder of Marjorie Gardiner. He was then sent back to London. The day before Neville was charged, a young woman named Kathleen Evans was walking through a wooded area, walk walking her dog. Um, and this was a place that was nearby to Bournemouth. When she was out for this walk, she noticed in a certain spot that there was a like weird smell and that there was like a swarm of flies. She noticed the same thing the next evening when she took her dog out for a walk. Um, so she decided to tell her father. She then took her father to this place, this specific point that she would see this, and they would find something that they weren't expecting to see. So they found a big like camel haired coat and underneath this coat was the naked body of Doreen Marshall. Police arrived quickly at the scene and along with her belongings, they found a string of 27 artificial pearls. Now, if you, oh, sorry, right so if you hadn't guessed, the artificial pearls that were found with Doreen's body matched the pearl that was found in Neville's pocket. A pathologist found um, Doreen's cause of death to be a cut to the throat. There were signs of um, blows to the head, which would have happened whilst she was alive. And then, unfortunately, after her death, she sustained further injuries, which, similarly to um, Marjorie, her nipples had been bitten off. And she also had, um, like, cuts the size of her torso, but in the shape of an A and a Y. Neville was put on trial for both murders, but his lawyer told him to plead not guilty for the second one. So that's what he did. But fortunately, the jury found him guilty of two counts of murder and they only took an hour to deliberate on this. So because of this, he was sentenced to hang. This is obviously back in a time when we had the death penalty in England. So Wednesday, the 16th of October at 9 a.m., Neville was waiting for his execution and is reported as saying, come on, boys, let's get on with it. He was also offered the traditional glass of whiskey to calm the nerves and he said better make that a double it's kind of like he was joking but he was eventually executed and he was hanged for his crimes so that's the end of that story it was a bit of a longer one today there's kind of a lot to fit in um, if you liked it please give a big thumbs up and if there's any cases you want me to cover please let me know also subscribe i think that's all i've got to say thank you for watching and i'll see you in my next video